good evening, everybody, and uh, welcome on this slightly wet May evening uh, to the last in the current series of lectures. Um, we've run a little bit later in the year than we normally do, but obviously we had a few challenges at the start. Without more ado, it's my great pleasure to hand over to our chairman, Mr. Tony Cox. Thanks, Lawrence. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this is the fifth lecture that we've managed to do on Zoom, and thank you all for joining us. Today, we're very pleased to welcome David Woodcock, a long-standing MRC member, and also a member of the Manchester Club, who are very grateful are joining us today. So um, this is, again, a first for us to have not just ourselves, but also our friends from Manchester. And I see there's one or two names I recognise just looking at the the pictures in front of me here. So welcome all of you, both in London, Manchester, and wherever you are in the world. Now, uh, David, as I say, is a long-standing MRC member and Manchester Club member. Uh, he actually attended the first ever lecture given by the MRC, which apparently was on the 5th of May, 1960. Uh, so we're now the 61st anniversary of that. This was by the Reverend Teddy Boston, who many of you may have heard of. Uh, but uh, uh, we're moving on today. Now, David now lives in Belgium and is joining us from there today. He's going to talk about Bembridge. Now, I have to admit a personal connection of this. I remember when I was a wee lad going to the Central Hall exhibitions and seeing Bembridge and being wonderfully impressed by it. I thought this P4 thing was absolutely wonderful. So little did I think that I'd ever be a, allowed to become an MRC member or even more their chair in years to come, but such is the way that life works out. So I'm delighted to welcome David Woodcock today to talk, tell us about Five Go to Bembridge. So over to you, David. Welcome, thanks very much. Right, Five Go to Bembridge. Uh, I'll start with a greeting. Bonsoir à tous, bonsoir à tous. And you'll be pleased to learn that those will be the only words I utter in French tonight. Um, I'm quite proud to be able to talk to the first joint MRC MRS joint meeting for perhaps three decades. Once upon a time, they were quite regular, originally at Birmingham and then swapped between Manchester and London, but somehow they drifted off and didn't. Uh, so what I'm gonna start with, rather than just talking about Bembridge, is since most people, won't know me from Adam. I'm going to do a very, very brief autobiography so that you know how I sort of fit into the club. Um, like a lot of people of my age, I started with a Hornby train set in 1951. That was really about the first, I'd been born in 1945, and that was really about the first time that toys became available because of course there was rationing. And it was just a little clockwork M0 train set. A few years later, I got a Duchess Hornby Double O tin plate, three rail, Duchess of Montrose. And the year after that, I got a 264 tank as well. And I had a five by three board on which I used to have a circuit and a couple of sidings. And I used to get built easy kits and build odd buildings to go on it. Um, I had the Hornby set, Hornby double set for quite a while. And I went, I was lucky enough to win the scholarship to go to Dulwich College for my secondary education. And one of the things we used to do there was to lay on a great Hornby double display in one of the science labs uh, on Parents' Day. And you can see top right in the picture there, about the only picture I have of that which isn't very great. About 1959, trying TT had come along and I thought I didn't really like Hornby Double I wasn't going anywhere uh, prototypically on it. Um, and so I thought I'd try Hornby, uh, the trying TT. So I built a layout, not a very good layout, but a, a layout that uh, took a bit of inspiration from uh, Peter Denny and his Lins laid layout had been in the railway modeler. Uh, and that's the middle bottom shot there. And then in 1960, 
I was 14, I'd been 14 just the previous Christmas, um, and I joined the Model Rally Club. And that sort of took me forward. I, of course, I was still at school. We used to do a lot of prep work in the evenings. So it was quite hard to get to Keen House, but I did manage it from time to time. And of course, the school holidays, I was there. Around the same time, although I don't think I got a copy immediately, um, Pico published uh, George Eliff Stokes' book, Buildings in Miniature, which quite inspired me, not least because he worked mainly with cardboard and cardboard was very accessible from cartons that food came in and things like that. So I started building my own buildings, following some of the designs in the book, in fact. In 1964, I went up to Oxford to read physics, although actually I got more interested in politics than physics. Um, and I used to go down to Pendham on the train to Upperfoot and then walking across the fields to help Roy England with the showing. Uh, and that sort of inspired me even more scenery wise. And in the, the the Christmas of that year, I went to Manchester for the show there and I joined the MMRS. And I've been a member of both those clubs ever since. In 1965, an another book was published called Landscape in Distress, which the Oxford, Uni Oxford Union Library got a copy of because it featured South Oxfordshire. And combined with Pendant's idea of going back into the past and replicating it as well as it could. Landscape in Distress was about the mess that was happening in the rural landscape. Although it's quite interesting looking through the book today to see the empty roads. So they, you know, there weren't cars scattered everywhere, but there was quite a lot of other mess. But that made me realize that doing scenery wasn't just about doing things that were perfect but doing things that were imperfect as well. Now, at that time, the Model Rally Club had a very strong junior members section, and indeed it had its own stand uh, at each exhibition, with its own static stand at each exhibition. And, and this is a shot, the middle shot there is of the 1965 stand. And you can see that there are a couple of inset uh, dioramas and the right-hand one, which is more or less central in the photo, although you can't see any details at all, it is something that I'd done in TT3. So also at that show, same 1965 show, George Meller gave me one of his new GWR Collier 042 tank kits. I had to pay him for the wheels and the motor, which of course he bought in, but he gave me the kit. And I actually made it up in my college room that uh, summer term. Now, then of course I was busy with various things, but still doing a bit of modeling on the side. I had a, 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 a TT3 layout that was reputedly based in from a suburban area. But then the Bembridge period came into my life, but I'm going to leave Bembridge for a moment to just finish off my autobiography. Because after Bembridge, um, I started dabbling in all sorts of things. There was an American engage layout. It, the model railroad uh, it featured uh, a continuous layout on a six by four, but I reduced that in scale from 187th to 1/160th and tried doing that. I, I never actually finished it for various reasons, but here's an example of. One of the scenic items I did for it, as I say, bear in mind that this is the small American engage. Another thing that was happening in my camp is that the uh, trying had produced these big O gauge plastic things that ran on batteries. Um, and various members had produced narrow gauge bottles around them that were battery controlled. And this was my effort, a model of Wren, which when I started it was in Capitol Museum, when I finished it was in York Museum. Uh, uh, bear in mind, this is 21 millimeters to the foot. So 
even for a tiny prototype. And, and you can stand alongside that loco and pat it on top of the tank quite easily. Um, that is a fair size model. It's probably at least a foot long, but it's got batteries sitting in the boiler. You can open the regulator and it will start off. If you want to put it in reverse, you pull the reversing lever. It's got inside valve gear, um, which you can't see in the photo, but I assure you it's there. So that was quite an interesting model to do. Now, work-wise, I was working for Sealink and I got involved in the very, very early stages of electronic publishing. Uh, and I indeed was one of the pioneers of using electronic publishing for commercial benefit. Most of the people who were involved at the time, and there were only a handful, were people in publishing, I mean, typically newspaper proprietors, who were worried about the future for their printed uh, papers if everybody was using electronic publishing. Uh, but I saw it went further than that. And here's just a picture of me with a very early terminal indeed. But bear in mind that this is back, back in 1978. So it's a very long while ago now. And people don't realize how long ago that was. And people used to come to me from all over the world. And I went, I, I used to talk at, at uh, um, conferences. I've been as far as Copenhagen to a conference to speak. I also started dabbling in O-Gage a bit, and I bought this rather nice pug from a puff's, Puffer's Kit, which um, did puff. It had smoke, had um, firebox glow, and it ran, if, if people remember the Inkerman Street O-Gage layout that was at the MRJ show at the Central Hall, which early ninth, about 1990, late, something like that. That works the uh, the lower yard in Inkerman Street. Uh, now, I'd been living in Brighton. In fact, my house in Brighton was in what had been the back garden of Stroudley's house, which was, I found rather nice. And I could, I went, if I climbed the, the foot of the garden, I could look out on the, the railway and Brighton works and the, the old Pullman works there. But in 2009, I realized, or we realized that Brighton wasn't going to be for us forever. It was changing very rapidly. And we took the view that we'd move to rural Belgium. And so top left, you'll see my new house. We didn't, moved here permanently immediately we took a little while doing it and for about a year we lived here one week in three and then once I was 65 we moved here full time um, much to my surprise I started producing layouts um, there was fake and tiles which was seven mil scale on 12 millimeter track and which actually featured in the Rowe Modelo, rather to my surprise. And then uh, an HOE layout, which was part of what they call the Croissé de la Toite. Um, doesn't translate very well, but it's a narrow gauge system where there were little uh, things that linked layouts and lots of people produced things like I'd produced there, and they were all put together at shows. And, and very weird, uh, the spectators could wander all round. Uh, it, it, you know, uh, there's, there's no spectator behind me there, but sometimes I'd find spectators looking up over my shoulder. Um, and I went, uh, the first show was at Sedan, which is actually where my nearest exhibition takes place every couple of years. I went to Laval, which is an almost in Brittany with the layout. And the shop here uh, is at Lille, where this was the first Transmania uh, exhibition there. And then there's another shot there, Sedan again, seven millimeter. That particular one, it was quite amusing. 
that's a little narrow gauge load, which is a white metal kit, British white metal kit. But the motor is upright in the engine compartment uh, and drives a, uh, and drives the lay shaft, which in turn drives the thing. And it's quite noisy. And that just the, the thing just shunted to and fro into a, a hidden siding. And I was quite surprised to see several people, several of the spectators bend down towards it and with their ear cocked. And eventually someone rucked up carriage and say, so no, he say, it's got sound. He couldn't see where you'd fit a sound chip into it. And it wasn't a sound chip at all. The noise of the, of the double worm drive sounded just like the prototype loco. <laughs> uh, it's really quite amusing. So that's me, I still, still dabble in all sorts of things here. Um, like, like the UK, there are no exhibitions on the continent at the moment. I was expecting to go to Sedan again in October this year, because it's only every two years, but that's been canceled already. So, well, I'll, go, I'll, I'll, I'll talk about Bembridge now. Let's go back to, well, actually, let's go back to 1967. Um, up until 1966, the MRC's post-war exhibitions have been a central hall which had two floors, an upper floor and a lower floor. Um, quite a cramped environment, even with two floors. But in 66, the news came that the Methodist Church, which owned Central Hall, wanted to convert the lower hall into some sort of uh, refreshment facility. And so it wouldn't be available for exhibitions anymore. So the club took the view that it had to look for somewhere else and it found the new horticultural hall, which of course was owned by the Royal Horticultural Society. And so we went there um, in 1967 at Easter. Easter 1968, we were there again, not quite the same dates as before, but quite close to it. But the real problem was that the that the RHS always gave priority to their flower shows, which of course are driven by the seasons and not by the calendar. And Easter wanders around the calendar, as you know. So in 1969, the, the new horticultural hall was not available for exhibition around Easter. So the decision was taken to move to the middle of August. Now, there'd been model engineer exhibitions in the middle of August, which had been quite successful. So the club wasn't too worried about this, but in practice it did prove to, bear in mind that we used to get typically 45,000 people through the doors in the five days that the show was open. Uh, and not enough of those people came in August. It was a financial disaster. Fortunately, a club member bailed the club out, well, the, I remember bailed the club out. So the club was all right, but it then had no choice but to go back to the central hall to a rather even smaller central hall with just the upper hall and some rooms off it uh, in 1970, but back at Easter. And that proved to be okay. But anyway, at this show, it was probably the club's best ever show at that date. And I was quite pleased to find myself being allowed to be a demonstrator, a demon, uh, for the first time instead of just being a steward. But at the show, there was the very first P4 layout, Ashburton by Dick Anderton and Ken Cottle. I, we'd seen it before uh, at an EM Gage event, but only under construction. But here at the August show, it was more or less finished and it was very interesting. But what we, the, 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 there were five of us that we were all sudden enthusiasts. We, the sudden people tended to gather in the library at Keen House for some reason. I, I think the, at least one of, the, one of us was involved with the library even then. Uh, and Eric Pointer was a sudden enthusiast as well, who's the librarian. 
Uh, so anyway, we found five of us, five, all Southern enthusiasts, keep looking at this layout, and it dawned on us that one thing that was possible in P4, and wasn't possible in O or EM, was to make an exact copy of a prototype. Because if you think about it, with a narrower gauge, any point is e even the one that follows the same curvature as the prototype is going to be shorter than it is on the prototype. And so that actually affects the ability to make an accurate model of the prototype, unless you've got a prototype trap gauge. So we thought to ourselves, thinking of course that the next show was going to be in August the following year, could we make a Southern terminal um, and display it? Well, we looked through the Southern Railway Termini, and here's actually a list of them. The ones in red were electrified for most for much of the Southern era, so they were really ruled out. The ones with the blind P were worked by push-pull units, so they wouldn't have been very interesting. All the ones in italics had already closed, and by and large, had been significantly demolished. Kemp Town was still as it was, but it was worked by a push-pull unit. And there was a very nasty four-way tandem point in the tunnel mouth there, which would have been difficult to reproduce. Now, it actually happens that since then, quite a number of these termini have actually been modeled quite nicely by various people. But at the time, we didn't think they were right for us. So we looked to the Isle of Wight. Uh, our first thought was Ventnor, Ventnor, ta uh, Ventnor Town Station, the main station, which was in an old quarry, came straight out through a tunnel mouth. Um, so ostensibly quite a nice place to model. It would have worked out about 11 foot long and it would have been very difficult to divide. But the real snag with that was that the club's deputy chairman, Ron Parron, was already trying to model it in double O, and it just wouldn't have been fair to have gone and copied his work, so to speak. Then we looked at cows. Cows was also approached through a tunnel mouth, but it wasn't nearly as compact as Ventnor. Uh, and it had a real snag in that uh, the run round was done partially by the stop moving under gravity, which would have been quite difficult to reproduce. But Alan, who was one of us, had a friend on the island called John Mackett, who's a Newport GP. And John Mackett made various inquiries about what was left, because all these places were shut. Uh, and we dis discovered that although cows was as a station was intact, a lot of the surrounding housing had been demolished and it would have been an essential feature of the background of any model. So we gave cows a miss quite sensibly, really. It would have been too large. So we moved to Bembridge, which was right at the eastern end of the island. Quite a simple terminus, only three points and a turntable. Um, and although it had closed in 1953, it was still largely intact. And the real stroke of luck, Alan had measured all the track work up and various other things. So we had quite a lot of basic information. So we decided that Benbridge it would be. Now, here's a night. Well, one of the other advantages of Benbridge was that there were quite a lot of aerial shots available. In those days, you could go to Aero films who were placed in Arbor Mile Street in Mayfair, and you could look through their files and order copies. This actually is slightly earlier than the period of event. The, the, the turntable was rebuilt at Benbridge in 1936 uh, to take, uh, so to take O2 tanks, still only a 25 foot table. It had been 16 foot before. Uh, so we thought we'd, 1936 wasn't a good idea because obviously things were being very fresh. So we stuck, we, we chose 1937 as our dateline. This shot is from about three, four years earlier than that, probably, probably about 1933, 1934. 
but it shows the thing quite nicely. The, uh, and we chose most of it for the model. Um, and I'll go on and I'll show the, the station there is largely hidden behind the Railsbridge Head Hotel. And one of the real disadvantages of choosing Benbridge was that we got this Royal Spit Head Hotel, which was a huge, great building. It was still intact. Um, it was no longer used as a hotel. It had become holiday accommodation, furnished uh, accommodation, but it was still there uh, and it was huge uh, and it would have dominated the layout. So we had to think what we we're gonna do with that. I'll show you in a minute what we did with that. Uh, there's the station there largely hidden, residential boat houses beyond then beyond that, we wanted to run in, but we didn't model that to scale. We just modeled it as a representative. And you'll see at the far top there that I've marked farm track crossing, which we didn't incorporate initially, but we did eventually. Some more aerial photographs. Uh, this is actually very much at the time that we were modeling. And that was incredibly useful, that photo, because it showed us things like the, the vegetable patch for the station master. It showed the amount of, you, you've got a very good idea of the amount of clutter, uh, the pile of sleepers there were reproduced on the model. Uh, and that really made up to quite a nice, Thing we thought anyway, we, because at the time we didn't know. And there again, you can see how the Royal Spit Head Hotel top left dominates the scene. Uh, this is actually a post war shop, which we didn't have at the time, but it does show quite nicely the turntable and a carriage there, a spare carriage stored in the thing. And a fountain right at the bottom there, a fountain. We'll come back to the fountain later. These were the drawings that Alan, the sketches that Alan had done. I suppose he was born probably three years before the war. So it's probably about 37 himself actually. So um, in 69, the, these would be 32. Uh, these were uh, nearly 20 years old at the time he had done these as a teenager, the, the track, remained at Benbridge, although not in use until about 1958. But all, if I show the next one, which is a close-up one, you can see there that he detailed very carefully all the track work and how it went. One great advantage to that that has never happened again on a P4 layout is that all the track work represents what was there at the time. There's no standard template work in that at all. It's all the proper stuff, all the rail joints are in the right place. And eventually we even put in the, all the correct point modding. So having made the decision in middle, well, not in order, because it took us a couple of weeks. So it was early September before we made the decision we're going for Benbridge. So the last day of the summer, summer timetable in the Isle of Wight was Sunday the 18th of September. John Mackett again had assured us that the station was still there at that stage, although we knew it was threatened very heavily. And in fact, it barely lasted into 1970. But that's the sort of state it was in then. We were greatly amused actually to find when we went there on this uh, away day out, family away day, every, all the families came, um, was that the, the greenery in the back here that led off the, the old track was full of act, actung mining signs, and warning of mines. So there, there obviously it obviously been a kid's playground. Anyway, we got there and we set to a very hard, Ian Lyle, who was one of the, members of the group uh, was a, had been well, was still a keen amateur photographer. He took lots of shots. These aren't Ian's there in the archive at Haven Street these days, and I haven't got access to them, but these were taken off the internet. Um, and they do they, they show exactly what it was like at the time. The signal box had gone. 
uh, the bookstall had gone. In fact, the bookstall had gone during the war. Um, uh, so none of the post-war photos show the bookstall. So the bookstall is a big problem. But I'll come back on to that uh, in a while. This is just one of the dimension sketches that I took. And this just shows, this doesn't show the building. You can imagine how detailed the building sketches were. But this just shows the two gate posts in concrete into the goods yard and demonstrates the extent to which we were later able to reproduce everything accurately. So this is what the layout looked like. Uh, you've got the, uh, at the very bottom left, you've got the later extension. It, uh, initially that salt marsh and pool plugged straight into the fiddle yard. There was just the white, at the end of the fiddle yard, there was just a white board with a hole in it that the trains ran through. I wasn't very happy with that, but at the time there was nothing better we could do with it. But the later extension solved that improper problem in due course. The only building in inverted commas that, that was on that approach board was a little permanent way hut, which was actually an old van. I'll, I'll show the drawing that was done for that later. Three sidings, um, which because they came off the curve track all the point where it was very long, there wasn't really anywhere where we could sensibly divide that board. So it was a very long, it was almost eight foot long. It was quite narrow, but it was long. And it was quite, at the time, we'd been used to transporting layouts to and from the Cub Show. And when I first joined, we used to have furniture vans complete with drivers. But that became expensive and was substituted by hiring lorries. And there were enough club members that actually had lorry licenses who could go around and pick up layouts and so on. So initially, we didn't think too much about uh, the problem of transportation. And that was a bit of a nuisance. But in fact, only two of the five members had driving licenses and their own vehicles. And John, fortunately, had a Paul Cortina estate, and that main board would just fit into the corner of Tina estate, perched right up against the windscreen at one end, and the, you could just close the tailgate on, on the other end. So we were able to transport it around, but not at all easily. Um, it proved eventually that that was a very, very good shape for a layout. You could sort of stand anywhere along the front of that layout and you actually got a good view. We hadn't realized that until it was exhibited, but it proved to be the case. I could never understand just how popular the layout was. Uh, you used to get people standing five deep behind the barriers. Quite amazing. And they used to stand for ages watching, partly, I think, because there was so much on there that. Um, could be seen that you didn't need a moving train. There were lots and lots of things to see. I did the sketch, which before we did it, which more or less shows what we did, uh, not from, from a sort of the fiddle yard operator's viewpoint, you might say. Um, but this was just to prove that it did look all right. Um, and we're quite pleased with that. And so we did. We then moved on. Oh, and once the word got around the club, what we were doing, we were very pleased to get a, quite a lot of assistance from various members because, because the club in those days had several hundred members, not all of whom turned up at Clean House, but there, there were very busy meetings. Um, uh, there certainly be uh, lecture evenings could e easily have several hundred people in Keen House in those days. Um, and members came up and said, "With well, here you're doing Benbridge. Here, these are some photos that we took when we were on holiday there 10 years ago. Or, and these are actually from Ted Hailstock, who was a well-known American model, um, well, model of American layout, shall we say. I don't think he was actually American although he'd worked in the States, so he'd actually got a little bit of an American accent. Um, 
Uh, and they were typical of the sorts of things that, that, that we got. We got lots of advice and help and people would, you know, you could talk to people about what if we do this, what if we do that? And, you know, and it was quite, it was nice building it in a club atmosphere. The layout was privately financed, um, but the mo for the most part, it was built in the library at Keen House. Um, obviously, we needed rolling stock, locos. We were very lucky. Alan was one of the group. Alan had done the masters for the Wills O2s. And he already had a number of them. Uh, I think probably four in total uh, that he built. They'd been painted professionally by what was then, a, or who was then a very young Alan Black, Black, Black and Dara. Uh, they were very nice. But of course, they needed new chassis, uh, which we, Alan, built for them. We were quite lucky that the right size wheel happened to already be available from Studio Lift. There were, there were very few wheels available in those days. And Studio Lift actually changed their production schedule so that the um, bogey wheels were available to us as well. Uh, so we had several of these O2 layouts, which locos, which were the main locos to be used uh, at, in fact, they were the only locos to be used at Bembridge once the turntable had been extended in 1936. So they were right for the thing. We also had a terrier. I don't have a photo of the terrier, but this is what it was, W8 Freshwater. And I'm pleased to say it's still with us today on the Ollowhead Steam Railway. So this is a photo actually of the prototype. We didn't, Studio Lift didn't do wheels for this, but Stephen Paul did the right size double O wheels in aluminium, and we had them turned down to the P4 profile. Um, so that's all that full. It was actually a K's kit that um, Alan had put together, but the K's kit, uh, shall we say, wasn't quite, didn't quite follow the prototype. Uh, and Alan put that all right, so that the loco was actually a very good model. And here was the one that we never got. Uh, it would have been very nice to have a rare peacock that had run on the Rowie in early southern days, but um, there was no kit. It's quite a complicated loco, as you can see. We didn't have the wheels available, so it remained a dream, and it remained a dream. Um, unfortunately, we, were, we would have liked one, but it was just an impossibility. This sort of shows the range of, road, of rolling stock. There's a loco there in the middle. To the left, the he was by, on the way to becoming the chairman of the club, Ron Parron. These were two, two of his coaches that were just right for Bembridge. And he was by then having second thoughts about Bentner. And so he said very kindly that we could have those coaches on permanent loan. We obviously had to re-bogey them for P4, but that saved us an awful lot of work. We did, however, have two other tra uh, carriage sets so that we could uh, have a variety of trains running. Peter put her together for Kay's Stroudley four-wheelers that had run on the branch in early southern days, which had to be uh, uh, amended for P4, of course. But also we discovered that um, there was something seriously wrong with the kit in that uh, on one side of every vehicle, the doors were hung the wrong way round. And Peter put a lot of effort into totally redoing that on one side so that the doors were correctly hung, whichever way round we ran the set. We also were one of the early pioneers of etching. Um, there was an Exile of White Central Railway uh, bogey two set that we that John who was quite a good draftsman uh, drew up and we went to a printer and we had zinc etchings done 
the etching process wasn't perfect in those days. It produced very nice panelling, uh, but it couldn't cut the windows out. So the windows, every window had to be drilled and then cut out and filed out. But when it was put together, it looked very nice. So we had three ca different carriage sets. We had enough locos so we could run quite a variety of trains. We also, Alan had some wagons, mainly vans already, uh, but Ian and Alan set to get together and built a number of open wagons of various sorts. Here we've got a pair of engineer's wagons, uh, but obviously there were coal wagons and there were more vans, passengers, luggage, an advanced van and a brake van, uh, which were built uh, and, and ran. We used Alex Jackson couplings throughout. You can see one here on the wagon quite clearly. Um, we I'd first seen those on the press on layout when it had been at Central Hall in April 1962 and had been very impressed with the workmanship. In fact, it was really that show that had put me in mind that Manchester was a very desirable club to join. And in fact, Jeff Platt, who was a club who, who by then was based in London and lived at Purley, um, had actually introduced me to some of the Manchester people, um, Norman Whitnell, uh, John Langham, Sid Stubbs, um, so are you. And also at the 1969 show, there'd been a chap from Merseyside actually demonstrating these couplings. So we knew these were the right ones for us and we put electromagnets in the right place. So operation was a total hands-off operation. It was very good. Uh, again, more views of the country, the brake van end of the carriages the uh, station building beyond a fish van. Um, there wasn't a lot of fish movements on the island's railways, but there had been complaints about the smell lingering when the vehicles were used for passengers luggage in advance. So the fish vehicles were specifically labeled that they were only to be used for fish traffic. And this is one of them. Again, that's Alan's work. Here are some of Ian's open wagons sitting in front of the uh, coal storage yard. Um, actually, I've got both, both the boards here say orchard, but in fact, I now know that that was a mistake, that there were actually two separate agents here. The, the, the siding was known as orchard siding, so probably orchard had, only, had originally been the only merchant there, but by this time there were actually two merchants. So the sign should actually have different names on. And I have to say that the blue color is a guess, uh, are probably not a very good one. Um, the coal storage yard, and there was also a building that was on the platform that was used to store passengers' luggage from the passenger luggage and advance facility. And both of these were uh, covered in corrugated iron. I wasn't at all impressed with the corrugated iron that was available on the market then. And actually, I'm not very impressed with what most of what's available even today. And I was lucky enough to find in Lyle Street. I don't know if some people may remember Lyle Street once upon a time had a few Chinese restaurants, but it was mainly secondhand surplus stores. And I found in one of those an old meter that had got some elongated gear wheels, which when put together gave very nice one millimeter corrugations. So using aluminium foil, I made all my own corrugated iron, which was which covered this building and covered the other one. But it didn't take paint very well, but I did eventually persuade it to take paint ad adequately. You can also see here that for the good siding, there's a point lever uh, and you can see the rodding that we, we wasn't there for the, 91, uh, the 1971 show, but was put in later. And of course, the station masters, uh, runner beans are there on the left as well. Uh, the trees you can see here, uh, I'm afraid we uh, were rather naughty. Uh, these are Marion Woods trees that had been on Longridge, uh, and um, we borrowed them. We had intended eventually to make our own, 
but somehow we never got round to it. And so these stayed with the layout. But by then Longridge wasn't really, or at least that part of Longridge wasn't really used. So uh, they served as well, they served the club well as well. Um, the, I took responsibility for the scenery. Um, and it was decided that the scenery included the turntable. The turntable was quite an important part of the scenery. As you can see, it was an essential part of the run round. So if the turntable didn't work, uh, the layout wouldn't work. So we had to solve that problem very quickly. Uh, we had sufficient photos. This is a Funnily enough, it, okay, again, this is taken off the internet. This is a Roger Joanne's photograph and rather, in 1958. And rather, a, it's rather a coincidence. I was actually at school with Roger, so um, I, I didn't know he'd taken this photo. And it wasn't what we used. But we did find sufficient photos that showed the turntable that enabled us, and we knew the diameter, of course, and it enabled us to draw it up and make a rather nice model. Here's the drawing that I did. Um, uh, and it shows it in all its surroundings. The, the concrete work was still there in 1969 when we measured it all up. So we knew it, how it all fitted in. Um, one of the things with this turntable was that I actually made up the chair track. We had some, I had it in my store, some cast, probably white metal chairs. Uh, and as there wasn't too much strain on the track, on the turntable, the locos just ran onto it straight and ran off straight. I was able to make up chair track, which obviously looked better than something um, sitting on rivets. It, and probably it was easier to do than doing it on rivets too, because it was straight and it was short. But this was the very first chair track that ever appeared on P4 layer. Um, because these days, uh, most of them are made up with plastic chairs. Uh, powering the turntable was an interesting problem. But we decided that because the real turntable was very, very rarely used for turning locos. It normally just moved them through that small degree that was necessary for run rounds. The only time that they ever turned locos was if a loco, in those days, there was effectively a very large triangle on the Isle of Wight when the Newport Sandown line was still there. So sometimes locos would end up at ride works for overhaul and they'd be the wrong way around. If that happened, they put the loco on the Benbridge branch for the day, and at the very end of the day, it would actually be turned on the turntable, so that it was then the right way around for the works. But that probably only happened a couple of times or so a year, so we didn't need the turntable to turn. So what we did was we used one of these motors, which I had acquired in a club rummage sale, and they were very they were considered to be very good motors at the time. Uh, Zenith were actually bought by trying which is why the early trying motors were called trying X04 motors, because they were on the next generation on from these particular ones. But the great advantage of these motors was they had a gearbox incorporated into their design, as you can see here. So I coupled um, a, a studded threaded rod onto the, what was intended as the loco axle and a nut ran up and down the threaded rod, which drove one end of the turntable just through the necessary degrees. And by fitting a couple of contacts that we'd uh, taken from an old relay uh, and putting in some substantial stops as well, we could guarantee that the turntable would just simply turn between the two points that we needed it to, because, because bear in mind in P4, it had to align perfectly each time. Um, and it, we used the contacts that had come from the relay to do the switching of the, the crossing that was off the turntable, and also to stop the motor turning 
Uh, and there are obviously a couple of diodes in there as well to, to, to make it happen. So you just had a simple switch on the um, control panel that uh, enabled you to just simply one way or the other and the turntable turn where you wanted it to. The drawing I'd done for the turntable, we expanded simply by sticking bits of paper onto it so that it showed the rest of the surrounding curb work and, and things like that. So, uh, and also where the fence posts were for the fence around it. The fence was still there, which was very useful because I can measure it up. Um, the palings in the fence uh, had obviously all been made by hand. They weren't sort of standard joinery work palings. So they were a bit different and they weren't always spaced right. Uh, and we'd discovered from photos that one or two of them were broken. And that was all carefully reproduced. Uh, and we even made sure that we got the curbstones right in the model. So really quite a careful model. And this is what the turntable looked like. And you can see the fencing around it uh, and shingle ballast. Um, shingle ballast was quite interesting. Nothing available from the trade really was suitable. So we used, decided to use sand, but the only sand that we could get that was suitable was a bit too coarse. Fortunately, Peter, through his work, had access to an industrial grinder. So this was used to grind the sand down to the right size for the ballast. The uh, industrial grinder didn't actually quite like this task and eventually gave up the ghost, but fortunately had produced enough correct size sand for us to use. So, and of course, sticking the track down in exactly the right place and, and ballasting it in the same mood, uh, action was quite nail biting, but we got it right and it all fitted. And one of the things we found all the time with this is that it was amazing how with P4, everything just fitted into place. If you did it, made it to scale, it worked. You could, you know, we we made the platform edge quite separately from the track that was going to go up against it. No problems. We actually managed to run a bully Pacific along that track and it fitted just within both the platform edge and the canopy, despite the fact that it was considerably bigger than the Isle of Wight's quite constrained loading gauge. Uh, so, and the other thing you can see here is this rather nice car. We were just very lucky at the time, jet petrol were having a promotion. You bought a gallon of jet petrol and you got a little plastic car kit free of charge. And um, some of them were totally the wrong scale for us, but some of them were very, very close indeed to four millimeter scale. They were all rather gaudy colors. I think they'd been intended for kids and so forth. But they were well done. Um, and this car is actually one of them made up and painted very carefully. Um, and although you might say that's a little bit old for 1937, the Isle of hadn't really been served by car fares until about then. So the Isle of had quite an old car stock. So that is very typical of the sort of vehicle that could have been seen in the island in 1937. So we're quite pleased with that. And we used the bits and pieces from other uh, the, the, the jet things uh, to make up a lorry uh, and a van. And yeah, it worked quite well. Um, now, I think probably this is about the time to have the PMB, is it? Absolutely, David. I think we've had a most fascinating first half. And at normally at this point, uh, we'd be putting the lights on and forming a queue for Hugh to serve us with drinks uh, or coffee. Unfortunately, tonight we don't have that facility. Um, there's nothing in the electronic world that will allow us to get drinks to you, but we could still use the coffee. Um, you'll see in a minute when we put up the slides that we have a coffee donation pot. Uh, we hope you're enjoying the talk tonight. And if you feel you've enjoyed it, We'd be most grateful if you could make a small donation to us in order to defray the expenses incurred. But in the meantime, we're going to take a 15 minute break and we'll be back 
uh, at about, oh, where are we now? 32. Quarter to, quarter to nine, 8.45, or where David is, 9.45. Thank you, everybody, and welcome back to the second half of an utterly fascinating talk. Um, I'd like to do just a couple of quick parish notices. Obviously, thank you to anybody that's made a donation through the coffee account. If you haven't, we'd be grateful if you will. Um, dates for the diary. First of all, for those of you that have never had the chance to go backstage on Copenhagen Fields, we are having a backstage weekend on July the 10th and 11th. Uh, details are on the events page and we hope to see as many of you there as possible. It will be a chance to go backstage as well as in front. There won't be the Toblerones. There will be great access for photography and this will be a quite special occasion. And I believe we've got a little treat for each person who attends to take away. Mm -hmm. I've also got the initial run of uh, talks organised for the um, autumn. I'm pleased to say that we start on the 9th of September with Phil Parker. Those of you that know him will know him as either a writer for BRM magazine, but he's also the editor of Garden Rail. And his talk is rather euphemistically known as Put It in the Garden. So I suspect we're going to go to some slightly larger scales. 14th of October, a lovely lady by the name of Carol Flavin, also known from the Loco Ladies, uh, will be talking to us about the creating scenery. And then on the 11th of November, Gareth Dennis, who's a lecturer at the Birmingham Centre for Railway and Education, will be talking to us about track work in the, on the real railway. Of course, December is reserved for the AGM. So I hope you look forward to those. More details, obviously, in the bulletin and on the events page of the website. Well, without more ado, it's a great pleasure to hand back to our brilliant speaker. Right. Is that working right? Yes, yeah, spot on. Good. Right. So this is the station. This is the back of the station building. Although one of the weirdities about Benbridge is that the station building was built the wrong way round. This should have been the railway side, and the side that faced the railway should have been the side that faced the road. But nevertheless, this is what happened. Uh, and so this is the station building. Uh, you can see it's quite a quite a big station um, and needed quite a lot of work in put into it, drawing it up, um, working out where everything went, seeing what was difficult to do and what wasn't. So drawings, I had some old um, audit paper that I used for the drawings. These days, of course, I do them on the computer. Um, I normally use Inkscape for my drawings which is very good. But these were draw, drawn up on this paper, which being square, squared, but not too full of squares, um, was quite easy to use, fairly good, fairly good quality paper, so it was easy to rub things out when necessary. Uh, and I made sure I got everything right. Um, this is the, as I say, the roadside that we've just seen. Um, this is, one of the ends. The building had, we were going to use Slater's brick for it, which had just come out at the time, very fortuitously. Uh, and I got lots and lots and lots of black plastic card. So everything was laminated. Fortunately, in those days, MacPack took laminations quite well without giving you later problems with the everything distorting. Um, I've discovered since that that's no longer the case. Um, but there are other uh, solvents available which actually do the job. But anyway, that's what we used then. There were always a minimum of three lamentations. The back of the station building that we saw there, you can see it's got all those arches in it. So they were all done by building up and building up and building up. Uh, so that uh, there were quite a lot more laminations there. But you can see here that, well, 
that there were two problems that we had to solve. The first was that the main roof tiles had some ordinary tiles and some scalloped tiles. Uh, so we had the problem of the tiles. The, the, the straight tiles were easy. I used 10 thou plastic card for the tiles. That's a little bit on the thick side. The real tiles are half an inch thick, which would come out at about seven thou. Uh, but, but so 10 thou is a little bit thick, but not too much. Uh, in fact, by the time I got the solvent on it, it probably came down to somewhere quite close to scale. To do the scallops tiles, I got two strips of aluminium, put them together, put them with screw holes at each end so they could be tightened up. Um, and I, I've shown here very roughly what it looked like. Uh, they were filed to exactly the right profile. I've actually shown 10 scallop tiles here. The ones I used were actually 20 tiles long. And then I put lots of sheets of the, 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 the 10 thou plastic card cut to the right size in between those, tightened the screws up so they were done. And then all those tiles were filed to produce the scallops. It sounds like a terribly onerous job, but it actually was quite quick. I was surprised how quick it was, and it did produce excellent tiles. Um, the other problem we had was a much bigger problem. There, were a lot of, there was a lot of dog tooth brickwork which comes where the bricks are laid at an angle. You can see it there in the, the drawing, in the, sorry, in the photograph, Mark dog tooth. That was a real problem. And I think in many respects, that would remain a problem today. Not very long ago, the, uh, Ralph Robertson gave, Robertson gave a very good talk to the Manchester Society on building one of the big mills there for Slatterts Junction. Uh, and of course, these days, various modern techniques are used, but I think they would have great difficulty in producing accurate dog tooth brickwork. So I gave a lot of thought, had to give a lot of thought to that. Um, the, uh, I asked various experts, nobody coped with the problem. So I had to develop, I saw, and then I happened to see an Airfits cap or wagon kit, do you remember? Where, I think there were probably three bob the cattle wagon. There might have only been two bob. They weren't expensive anyway. And I realized that the nice flat floor in that kit gave all sorts of opportunities. And if you look at the bottom left on this diagram, you can see what I did. I marked it out and then carefully filed right angle slots across it. And then I cut in the other direction, I cut one millimeter strips. And that was a perfect reproduction of that to scale of that dog tooth brickwork. And it really made the ultimate model. You can see here the tiles with the, you can, yes, you can actually see the dog tooth below the gutter line. You can see the dog tooth coming out and how well it worked. It was very, it took, a, the main thing was getting the file uh, right angle slots, the, the V-shaped slots right. Doing, cutting the one millimeter strips was actually remarkably easy. The, the plastic was just the right degree of hardness to get it right, but then to slice easily. So I was very pleased with that. And you can see there, there's various poster boards and all sorts of other things. Uh, that were, The poster boards here are still blank, but uh, before we went to the show, they'd all had posters added to them. And some of the other shots will actually show the posters. Here's, here's the two ends in the drawings. Note how they're done on the same piece of paper so that you can make sure that everything ties up height-wise. Um, and so ev everything we can see here still existed, but there were things that didn't exist. I'd actually shown on the left-hand drawing, the stretcher box. The stretcher box was actually a Second World War fitting. So 
it was deleted from the model. It wasn't there. The big, one of the big problems was the WH Smith bookstore, which had been removed during the war and there was a brick wall in its place. We knew from the 40 foot plan roughly what it looked like in plan, but the only photo that showed it was a distant shot by Stanhope Baker that had been taken in 1936. Ian worked quite, cl uh, quite close to the WH uh, Smith headquarters and so we went down there. They had a very good archive full of photographs of all sorts of bookstores, but sadly not one of Bembridge. However, we did get quite a good idea of what their airs bookstores looked like. And taking all the information we had, we were able to come up with this, which if it wasn't right, was very close indeed. Notice that there are three trestle tables outside, which had sort of books piled on them. And there was also the board which took, we think, took the daily newspapers so that people could see what daily newspapers there were. One thing one has to remember that in those days, the station bookstores were almost always the only news agency in the place concerned. So all the newspapers were sent out from there, um, as well as casual sales to two passengers. This is uh, the view of the State, you can see the station in there, the signal box. The signal box had gone when we went down to measure it up, but it was a standard Stevens box. Uh, and we knew from the photographs how high it was and things like that. So it was actually very easy to draw. The signals had gone at the start of the Southern Railway era, but the box was still there, the frame was still there because it still worked all the points, etc. The road that ran along the back of the station was owned by the railway, it was actually a toll road. We didn't model the full width of the road, so the toll hut isn't there, but the toll gate was, as you can see in the photograph. Um, at the 1985 show, we, I was very aware that we didn't have a full set of photographs of Bembridge. And so by then I had a half decent camera and I put a lot of effort into taking lots of photographs. Unfortunately, we were under a white sloping roof, uh, quite a low sloping roof, as it was a modern building. Um, and the camera, for some reason, even though I was using 400 SA film, uh, the meter was off put by this sloping roof and the photographs all ended up underexposed. I was using quite a small uh, stop on them because I wanted to get the depth of focus and it just didn't work. So very disappointingly, we've got far fewer photographs of Bembridge than I would have liked to have had. Uh, this is one of the ones that was sufficiently good to be viewable. Uh, and one of the other things this shows is that one of the things I did for the 1985 show was to make an additional carriage, which was actually a former Midland Railway carriage that had been used by the Isle of Wight Central Railway as part of a rail car. Uh, but the Southern Railway had rebuilt it. It lasted to, in service to 1937. It certainly worked on the branch of times. So I used a couple of ratio kits spliced together in various places to make quite a nice, it wasn't quite a scale, but it was within a few percent. So it, it certainly looked very good and it was something different and it was quite nice to contribute um, an item of rolling stock when I'd only done scenery up to that point. Again, you can see the sleepers of the, the form part of the clutter which we'd seen in the aerial photograph before. Um, this is another rather nice view of the end of the say You can see that some of the posters, the timetable posters, etc., you might expect to find outside the station had appeared by then. The date in the end brickwork, uh, the details of the brickwork, more of the dog tooth brickwork, uh, the tiles again. They were, there were no straight tiles on this particular part of the roof. Uh, and the postman who is about to empty the box is standing on the weighing machine, uh, which uh, was actually just a piece of black plastic card carefully scribed 
to uh, look, make it look as if it was a weighing machine. Notice also there, uh, I think it's probably a chocolate machine. Um, we've been able to check from photographs what mach machines of various sorts were in various places around the station. And I spent quite a lot of time looking at museums to see which ones had got machines like that. And when I found them, I measured them up. So they're all accurate models, all the ones that we incorporated. I was also quite amazed at the extent to which I was able to letter various signs. All the lettering on the side, look at the exit only, for example, over the gateway. All these were all painted by hand by me. I look at them now and I think, how did I ever manage it? Another view looking down, you can see the elaborate chimney stacks. Each of those chimney stacks incorporates around a thousand separate bits of plastic card. And there are two of them. So, but they're in exactly the right place. Uh, and again, you can see that the tiling and that work quite well. The canopy, um, or, or even on the even on the platform form all the posters were there even though they were quite difficult to see so we i tried very hard to make everything as accurate as, as absolutely possible so it really did look like it did in 1937 and another you can see here a seat on the platform more machines few passengers we there must have been times when the station was thronging with passengers but the photographs clearly showed that most of the time there weren't many people around so we stuck with about a dozen people on the layout. They were all FX, which were quite nice models. Uh, they were made in some sort of horrible plastic, but once you persuaded paint to stick to them, they were nice models. And there's a bike there. There's some various uh, sack barrows. The sack barrows aren't quite as good as the ones that you could um, make with Ivan Smith, the late Avon, Ivan Smith's uh, Southern Bridge model ones these days, but of course they weren't available in those days, otherwise I might have used them. Uh, and you can see, that's the best view I've actually got of the fountain, but uh, we'll come back to that in a minute, uh, later in the talk. Another view across that shows some of the platform. I want a rather nice sentinel lorry in the, the, the distance that I think Ian did. And gates, um, buffer stops. I, I'd done all the scenery, to all intents and purposes, I did all the scenery, apart from the point rodding that Alan did. Um, and it's all, as, as I say, as accurate as possible. The station had a running in board with various posters either side of it and again on a paling fence. This had gone post-war. Uh, it, it had originally had enamel signs on it. Um, and the enamel signs we know were there in 1932 and they certainly weren't there in 1936. And we suspect the fence was damaged when they were taken off. Um, but anyway, we drew them up, drew the station name board up. You can see I originally got the station name board size a bit wrong. So I've made a note, increase sizes and then drawn a rather bigger one. Um, and the lamp there, I found a lamp of that, that lamp had gone, but I found a lamp of the same pattern somewhere else in the Isle of Wight. And I haven't got the diagram here, but I've got measurements on it that show, that I've got about, a, hundred different measurements of what it was like. So it's, again, very nice, accurate model. And that's a very cruel enlargement showing the hand painted posters. Uh, there were commercial posters available in so-called double O gauge at the time, but they were tended to be much too big. Um, we had no idea whether they were right for the period or not. And I put a lot of effort into finding sufficient posters that were the right period and then painting them by hand. And again, each of the boards is lettered in hand. The 
luggage barrow there. It was a special Isle of Wight design. They were actually designed to sling onto the ferries so they could actually be loaded at Portsmouth Harbour and taken across on the ferries. Um, they fortunately were still around to the mid 60s. And even while for fortuitously, I had um, measured them up then. And so I knew what they exactly what size they were and exactly what they looked like. And that was a model of one of them. Uh, the station name board, the letters stand out, and they're quite strange letters. They all had to be cut by hand and shaped and then put on right. Like quite, again, as I say, this is a cool enlargement, so it's, I'm quite pleased with it. Um, another view of some of the, the coal store and wagons. Uh, we added bushes when I added bushes when necessary. They were done in lichen because that was what was available in those days. But I seem to have treated it quite well. Uh, it's so although these are out of a bit out of focus in places, they had to find um, more hedge work that was done with a sponge. Uh, the boathouse, residential boathouses were quite big, but they were quite simple. So they were, they were quite good. The all the buildings, and because the layout was a keen house from the word go, almost the word go all the buildings had to be tested for size as they were built. Now, my only way of getting them there was to take them to work on the train and tube, and then get the tube to Keen House in the evening, and then back home afterwards. So initially, everything was tried as just their flat sides before everything was assembled, um, because it was fairly easy to take the flat sides without them getting damaged. Eventually, of course, I had to put everything together as, as, as buildings, uh, as the three dimensional buildings, but at least it was only one trip and they got there successfully. I was quite lucky that the Victoria Line started it. I worked in Victoria and the Victoria Line started at Victoria in those days, so I could carefully choose a fairly empty part of the train, at least with settling myself in. One oddity we had was the permanent way hut that actually sat on the next board. And I have one photo of this and a couple of sketches. Um, and I worked quite hard. And it, it was obviously an old van, but surprisingly, Alan didn't know. I'm not sure Alan ever knew exactly what old van this was, but uh, which was very surprising in the circumstances. Um, but anyway, we eventually produced this and Alan was quite satisfied with it. So this is what I modeled. Ah, now the thing I left to last because we could easily have exhibited the layout without it was the fountain because um, no one would have realized that the fountain should have been there, but I wanted it there. So this is the fountain. This actually is a, a, is a later shot that I took in color, but um, it's huge. It really is huge. I measuring it was a nightmare. The very few straight edges in that uh, very difficult to get to any of the upper parts, even sort of standing on bits of it, which I did. And in fact, eventually I developed a folding rod that had di foot dimensions marked on it and had a hook attached. And I stood as far, as high as I could on it and then hooked it over the bottom of the hoop that supports the light at the top and then stood back so that I could get a good idea of exactly what the measurements looked like. And then as I did it, I carefully kept looking at it and saying, now, is, does this look right on the drawing? And you can see I've gone from a sketch there in the middle to the drawing of the, the, the next to it and then again a blow up of the thing that was one made in plastic card white plastic card it's all laminated so that it's almost solid in plastic card and the uh bits that were in marble two colors of marble as you can see in the photograph uh were painted in two shades of a of a gloss pink paint uh and reproduced it quite well i think uh, although it's the whole thing is quite grey in the photograph on the left, 
photographs show that it was actually quite, it was white in 1937. So that was the last part of the thing. Here's a couple of shots that Ian took of it in 1971. This was actually just before we took it to the show. So you can see the poster boards got no posters on. They were still to be added at that stage. Uh, so they were done last thing. But to say Ian was quite a, uh, a keen amateur photographer. So he spent a lot of time actually working on the um, print so that it was just showed up about the layout itself. I'm quite pleased with that. This is looking from the station end, and this is looking the other way. Oh, and it shows Peter's four wheelers. Uh, not the terrier, unfortunately, but the, does show the four wheelers that he put together. And this is a few showing the station end again and comparing it with a ground level shot taken in 1936. And another one I took in 1970, just after the station building had been demolished. I said that we extended the layout slightly for the 1974 show because I'd been unhappy with the mouse hole. Well, we still had a mouse hole, but now I was able to disguise it with greenery and it involved putting in this crossing, which was on a trackway to a farm. Um, none of this was still there, but I found with some earth scraping that I could find where the holes for what had been the fencing, and particularly the iron wrought iron kissing gates either side. So I knew where I could find out where they'd been exactly and where various signs had been. Uh, I had drawings of signs already. I discovered that there was another one of these uh, sets of these kissing gates at a foot crossing just south of Ride. So they were carefully measured out. The gates were I found examples of them elsewhere again in the island again, so they were all accurate models. So we put this together as a rather nice little thing. This is a shot that uh, Ian took, the he built the van. And again, this is one of the rather disappointing shots from 1985 that shows it from a, with all the gates in position. Um, and it really fitted quite well at the time get the atmosphere of the thing. Notice again how everything is shingle there, so, and it's all this quite distinctive colored shingle. I said that we had some official BR photos. This shows one of the, this one of the BR shots that shows the complete layout with the pool and the salt marsh uh, and a train on it. And that's Carol Parron, who's the Ron Parron's eldest daughter. And, she worked for Sealink as a hostess at the time, which is why she was in uniform. But she used to sell, when she was younger, she used to sell guides at the exhibition. And there's a, a much younger looking me, which is when I still had hair uh, there. So who were we? If I go to Bembridge, we always, as I said, we always described ourselves as just members of the Model Air Cup. Peter Dunk was the oldest who left us sadly a couple of years ago. John Newton, as, a, as far as I he's not a club member. As far as I know, he's still alive. Um, last I'd heard, he just had some heart surgery, unfortunately, but I believe he's still alive. Alan again left us a couple of years ago. Ian sadly succumbed to the big C in the late 1990s. And I, as you realize from tonight's lecture, are still with us, and I was the youngest, uh, perhaps it's the reason why I should be one of the last survivors. And another view showing what it's all about that uh, Carol and I again, uh, with some spectators, these aren't real spectators, of course, because this was shot before the show opened. Uh, at the far end of the spectators is Arthur Hancocks, who was a prominent club member at the time and a model of the North London Railway. I think he really uh, be pleased to hear that Bow Junction was being modelled. And also, as you can see, sort of standing just behind, just to the right of Arthur, is um, Tony, who was the deputy editor of Model Rallies at the time. 
Um, and he was also the leading light in producing all those um, plastic narrow gauge locos that run seven millimeter track. He went to South Africa and took a journalist. He was a journalist, professional journalist. He took a journalism job in South Africa and very, very sadly, he had a brain hemorrhage, fatal brain hemorrhage, not very long after he arrived there. So he's a, gone a long while, because Arthur's been dead many years as well. And you can just, in fact, see a memorial thing to Geoffrey Keane behind their backs. Uh, so obviously Geoffrey had just died at that time. Uh, so that is it. I'm more than happy to answer a few questions. If you do the honors of being question master. Thank you. Um, a question from Finland. Uh, Peck has asked, um, do the slides still exist? He believes that it may be possible to tease out some more detail. Uh, I understand quite what you mean about the white balance challenge, but do the original slides exist? They do, and I don't think he would get anything out of them. I think I'd have managed to get something out of them if it was possible. They are little more than a haze. You can just about see that there's something there. Just about, I can just about work out what they are. But the ones I showed you are the good ones. <laughs> yes. Um, what happened to Bembridge in the end? Right. We sold it at the 1985 show. The, one of the problems we had with Benbridge was it's because it was difficult to transport, it was also difficult to store. We had originally stored it on top of li the, the library cabinets at Keen House, but we didn't want to outstay our welcome. So after the 1974 show, Ian negotiated with his employers, who were the Royal College of Surgeons, he was the librarian there, that they would store it in the morgue at the Royal College of Surgeons, which was an ideal place to store it because it was all temperature controlled. And uh, and so it lived there. And in fact, we, some of the work we did for resuscitating it for the 1985 show, we actually did at the Royal College of Surgeons in the morgue. Um, so it lived there, but, you know, I couldn't, I, uh, I couldn't store it, none, neither could any of the others. So, um, we decided we put it up for sale at the 1985 show. We sold it to a chap. He kept it for about four years and then he gave it to the Unlike Steam Railway. And I don't know whether they still have it or not. One thing I do know is that they cut it in half or it's been cut in half. I don't know who cut it in half. I did actually see it, much to my surprise, on an exhibition very local to where I lived in Brighton on an Isle of Wight steam railway stand. It was a total surprise to suddenly come across this thing, which for 18 months had been a major part of my life. Um, and in many ways, it was very sad. It, I mean, it was still in reasonable condition then, but it had been altered. The track had all been ripped up when they cut it in half and replaced, not in the right way. So it lost its historical value. Uh, and I don't know whether the Isle of Wight Steam Railway people have still got it or not. Uh, to be, to, I'm still a member, but I, I don't know whether they've got it or not. Um, well, it's that's... quite interesting to think that we built it in 19 months from the original concept to showing it at Central Hall. Uh, and there were five of us. So there were about eight man years worth of work went into it. Now, that's a very interesting comparison with Copenhagen Fields, where Tim tells me the current team's 13, but let's say that there have only been an average of 10, and it's been on the stocks for at least 30 years. As I say, it really, oh, they were talking about it in 1985. So in some ways, it's been on the go for 35 years. But even if you say it's 30 years and only 10 people, that's still 300 man years worth of work, which is a huge comparison. And yet, you know, we've got this here as effectively as quite a historical model of what was there. So I, I, I look at it, I, I wrote, the, the talk has been greatly helped by the fact that I've just written an article, the first half of which has just been published in Scale 4 News, and the second half will appear in July. Um, and doing all the work for that, 
made me realize just how much I put into this model. Uh, and I just don't know. It, it had the great advantage that it all fitted into exactly the right slot in our lives. Uh, Ian and Alan acquired children during the course of the 18 months that we were building it. Um, and I started to get very, very busy work-wise. Um, the, my car ferry control job became a more senior one. I was actually in the, effectively the controller. Uh, it was a time when it was a seller's market and an awful lot of work was involved there. I used, well, I didn't, for half the year, I used to work a double week effectively. But then when I started getting involved with uh, view data and electronic publishing, uh, I had a, a job and a half as well. So I, I and then later I worked for Eurostar. Um, it wasn't called Eurostar originally. And I was the market research and planning manager there. And that was also a very, very, very busy job. Uh, I was quite lucky uh, in 19... 95, just short of my 50th birthday, I discovered the hard way that I got an unfortunate hereditary condition that effectively ruined my immune system. Uh, and um, although I went back to work for a while, it became clear to everybody that that wasn't a clever idea. And not only did I, was I a member of a very good railway pension scheme that offered an excellent ill health retirement but they also gave me a couple of years ex salary as an ex-gratia payment so I was treated very well. One thing you can see in this photo by the way is the, the sort of good siding point and that was very interesting. The, the running we had we used to run a sort of sequel of the three pass different passenger trains and then the goods. The goods used to come in propelled we knew it became in propelled we didn't know quite what the work English was which was quite complicated but we used to do that but we used to occasionally get wagons come off on the point that took points <clears throat> and we didn't understand why the points were all we, we checked the measurements on the points they were all right we checked the back to backs on the wheels and they were all right and then one day Alan at work came across a drawing that showed the set of points and had a list of wagon numbers that came off on the real things. <laughs> that like, like a lot of old railway point work in sidings, it was bodged and they got, it was a bodge too far. So we'd accurately reproduce the points and in so doing, had accurately reproduced the new railways as well. Of course, there was no compensation. If the vehicles had been compensated, they, they might not have come off. But uh, it, still quite an interesting thing to have happened. <laughs> well, you say it's a prototype for everything, and it did amuse me that in BRM this month, they've settled on the perfect location for the perfect model railway as being Bembridge. But you talk about these eight-foot boards, and you talk about creating this in just 18 months. How were the baseboards constructed? The baseboards were, um, we used the, for the main baseboard, we used a fairly classic design of sort of um, the sides took the strength, the, the, they were laminated and you surprising what you could do with laminations to provide uh, um, strength. The, as you can see, they're not straight. And then there were various cross members, which we carefully cited to make sure they didn't come inside with point motors, et cetera, of the turntable, of course. Um, and then it was topped with carlet panel, which was um, softer than MDF, but otherwise of a similar sort of construction. And that proved ideal. That was topped with cork and all the all the contours were shaped in cork as well. So the platform and the, the, the site is not as level as it appears. You think of it as a level site, but there's actually quite a lot of contouring in there. And actually measuring up the contours was quite difficult in the first place on the real thing, but it's, it's all faithfully reproduced. The board that runs through the... Um, uh, the approach road 
was a more interesting design the curved there's actually one straight spine that runs through that and then various outliers attached to it that shape the side or that attach the sides um, and then there's two levels of carlet panel on top one level which forms the base and then another one that forms the railway embankment on top um, so that, that was how that was done um, and then the extension when it's done was quite simple and the fiddle yard was really very classic with big big walls around it we used to use the big walls to display prototype photographs and information about what we'd done so that people knew because obviously this was all new this was the really the first p4 layout that ever went on the exhibition circuit we were quite limited because of our transportation problems we had two or three MRC shows, as I say, 1971, 74, and 85. We had the NMRA convention in the summer of 71. We went to Manchester at Christmas 1971. Later, we did a three-day show at Bristol. Um, we, of course, Manchester was three days as well, both of which justified hiring a van, uh, which was more difficult in those days than it is today. Um, and we also took it to the Epsom and you'll show the Epsom bars in those days where we were filmed for Blue Peter uh, and we took it to the Greenwich show, um, the Greenwich and Narragage. Oh, it's a district, uh, yes. The district Railway Society. But of course it wasn't Narragage or anything like it, but it still won the Best in Show award. Uh, we might have been to one, two more shows as well, but I can't remember that. But as I say, it was the first one. I, and for various reasons, partly connected with the fact that it was owned by the five of us rather than the individual. It's apart from the articles in Scale News that are appearing now, it's never really been written up. The special edition, uh, special issue of uh, BRM that was done for Club Centenary had a short section on it like it did on other club layouts bearing in mind that this wasn't officially a club layout, but effectively got treated as one. Um, it, it was included, but otherwise it's never really been written up. But, you know, so now you know more about it. Than... Yeah, it's been absolutely fascinating. Well, thank you, David. And I'm now ready to hand back to Mr. Tony Cox. Hi, everyone. Um... David, that was absolutely fascinating. As I say, I recall seeing it at shows when I was much younger myself. Um, it has a history in club folklore, and I think you've explained so much of the history of it. That was absolutely fascinating, and I think we all enjoyed it. So thank you very much indeed. I would also like to thank um, our visitors from Manchester. Um, this is our the uh, first time we managed this, and I think it's the first joint meeting of our two societies for many years, and I hope it won't be the last one. So I hope to see many of you again virtually, or even in, if we're ever allowed to meet again in person as at one of our respective club rooms. So thank you all very much for that. Um, finally, um, I would just like to point out that, of course, next week, finally, the roadmap allows us to reopen the club. So we will be having our first club night for seven months something like that uh ne next thursday there is a slight catch is you, you do need to book and it is on our website because we do still have to restrict the numbers unfortunately under the current rules but we do hope to be getting to back to some normality next week so i look forward to seeing some of you in the flesh next week um but please do make sure you join us and for our friends in manchester when we are allowed to open properly. If you find yourself in London on a Friday, on a Thursday night, please come up to uh, Keen House and drop in and come and visit us when we're able to. So thank you again, David. Fascinating talk. Thank you, everybody. And good night. Thanks. And an enjoyable summer of modelling. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.